Although this program was made in 1982, the information contained in it was never presented on the regular media. It was, in fact, the New York Times in a story in January who disclosed the first part of the story, which was that the Green Berets, eight of them, were present during a torture session. And the member of the Salvadoran army who talked about this, who is now des deserted and who is living in Mexico, uh, he was somewhat intimidated, I guess, by talking to the New York Times. And he's later revealed to the to Mexican media, and that's the transcript in this story, in this article, that the Special Forces, and I should say the U.S. Special Forces, was created originally by the CIA. Uh, the Special Forces were actually involved in the torture as opposed to standing by observing it. The training facilities uh, for uh, uh, torture, for interrogation techniques, were in San Antonio, Texas at one time. It, it troubles me, uh, not uh, obviously because I was once part of all this, but also just as an American citizen, to realize that this country is indulging in activities that are just as cruel and just as, as depraved, in some cases, and almost as extensive as what, for example, the, the Gestapo indulged in in Germany. We haven't uh, liquidated uh, five million Jews, but uh, 800,000 minimum figure people killed in terrorist circumstances in the Third World is a lot of people dead. Former CIA official John Stockwell and co-editor of Covert Action Information Bulletin, Lewis Wolf. Tonight on Alternative Views. <laughs> Tonight on part two of Covert Action, part two of a three-part series, we again feature Lewis Wolf, editor of Covert Action Information Bulletin, and John Stockwell, former CIA official and author of In Search of Enemies and Red Sunset. We'll take you on a tour of covert intelligence activity around the world, some by the CIA, some by other countries, and even an attempted coup by the Ku Klux Klan. Now some news. We have something on the FBI. It seems like they're trying to climb back in our bedrooms and telephones and everywhere else, all of our uh, organizations that we have. Back on April 28th, there was a UPI story which quoted the FBI Director William Webster saying, folks, we have some new FBI guidelines, and that means we're going to be able to go into the political spying business again. But he says, don't worry about it. Uh, our agents uh, only will be doing it if we think that a crime is going to be committed. There were some pretty uh, stringent uh, guidelines laid down on the FBI back during the Ford administration as a result of the revelations of the COINTELPRO program from 1957 to 1951 to 71. Amazingly enough, I gave a presentation at a college class. These are college graduate students. They didn't know what the COINTELPRO program was. I thought, my God, is our memory that short? So to let you know what COINTELPRO was, it was J. Edgar Hoover's program to infiltrate, dislocate, disrupt any lawful political organizations which J. Edgar Hoover didn't like. They had wiretaps, bugs, surreptitious mail openings, break-ins. They uh, uh, sent anonymous letters and all to break up marriages. They disrupted meetings, ostracized people from their professions, got people fired from their jobs. They provoked target groups into rivalries that could result in death. They dynamited uh, uh, publishing places of uh, dissident press organizations. And our 
from our program on the Klan, we found out that the Klan had organized over 40 chapters of the Klan in North Carolina alone mm. back in the 60s. Anyway, it was a terrible, terrible thing. And but they're wanting to do it again, but uh, supposedly more gently. But in the June 83 edition of the Inquiry magazine, the Libertarian magazine, Matt Hentoff says, watch out, folks. The interpretation which William Webster gives on what they can do is much more broad than even tail gunner Joe McCarthy had in his heyday. And the new guidelines give to the agents to let them go on their feelings as to what uh, may advocate, only advocate, what they consider to be criminal activity, and that could be most anything. And as the, as the article uh, ends, it says, if keeping tabs on mere public advocacy is an authorized law enforcement activity, law enforcement activity in the domestic security field, then between what the FBI hears from soapboxes and informants and learns from collectively signed ads and letters to newspaper editors, folks, get ready for another COINTELPRO program. As an example of the sort of thing that the FBI has been doing over the last several decades and the subversive groups that they've been infiltrating and harassing, one case is the National Lawyers Guild. They've recently put a multi-million dollar lawsuit through the courts claiming that the FBI has been illegally harassing them, surveilling them, infiltrating their group since the 1940s. And during this lawsuit, a document came out that revealed that an FBI informer within the National Lawyers Guild Bar Association has every year been leaking to the FBI a list of all of the names of the members of the National Lawyers Guild that the FBI has put into its files to keep information on and to surveil. And they've also, the National Lawyers Guild, has uncovered over 400,000 pages of documents that the FBI had amassed on them that are in FBI files showing the depth of the surveillance of the FBI on the National Lawyers Guild. And they claim that another three million pages of documents have also been amassed by the FBI that the FBI has refused so far to release, but that freedom of information suits are trying to get opened up and disclosed. So here's an example of the kinds of groups that the FBI claim you have to have to keep their eye on. The National Lawyers Guild, this very subversive organization of liberal lawyers. There's, in this article in uh, Inquiry, it says that not only will the new guidelines allow the FBI to continue investigations uh, into organizations, but it can do it even when an organization is inactive, like if the International Workers of the World, the OIWW <laughs> Wobblies, if they wanted to get organized again, the FBI would be there, be one of the first ones to join up to to continue their surveillance of them, even if there is no immediate harm. This is a guideline, even if there is no immediate harm from the organization. And there's another thing that is continuing to, that we still have, which the media don't talk about, and that is the concentration camps in the United States. We have concentration camps, I think, what, there are six or eight of them around the country that are in caretaker status, and any time the president says there is a national emergency, the FBI trots out its files and says, okay, we'll put these people in these concentration camps. That's on the law, and they're just ready and waiting. I have one final piece of data on this National Lawyers Guild suit, and that is the FBI itself has confirmed that at least 13 Guild members were undercover FBI agents and 102 more were paid informants. This shows the extent to which the FBI has infiltrated even liberal groups like the, F the National Lawyers Guild and has also subverted or corrupted their members by making them paid informants of the FBI. So this just shows you that any group can be infiltrated and surveilled by the FBI. And on these lists of people to be put in concentration camps in the event of so-called national emergency are people like um, our good friend John Duncan, I imagine, from the <laughs> Civil Liberties Union. The Civil Liberties Union folks are on the FBI's list. People like uh, oh, Jane Fonda, Dr. Spock, dear Dr. Spock, is on the list. So hey, we might have a pretty good time in that concentration camp. <laughs> Don't you expect that we'll be there? Yeah. yeah.
I was a member of SDS back in the 60s, and I'll tell you what, there never was a more boring organization. <laughs> I went to about two meetings, and they sat around and argued about semantics and this and that. And finally, this one radical guy had real frizzy hair and just kind of a crazy dude. He was advocating taking over McDonald's, taking over this, taking over that. One of the meetings, he finally talked us in. We went down and, and occupied the McDonald's. <laughs> and after, after a while, I got to thinking, boy, this is pretty stupid. And I, I'd always been uh, an advocate of freedom of milkshake. So I ended up buying a <laughs> strawberry milkshake and going home. And that was the extent of my involvement with SDS. Uh, but I'm sure it's in a file somewhere. And that guy who, that, who provoked everybody to doing it more than likely was an FBI agent. It was obvious because he was so blatant about it. They found that uh, in previous programs we've had on civil liberties, they found that the fellow who triggered the Chicago riot by skinnying up, uh, climbing up the, uh, um, oh, not a ladder. What do you call those things in the parks where the pigeons Flag jump pole? on the maple no. or statue? statue? Statue. That's it. <laughs> anyway, this guy climbed up on the statue and and uh, fluttered a Viet Cong flag up there, and that uh, triggered the police. Then another another person went up and slapped a policeman in the face. Both of these guys, even though they had beards and long hair, were both police uh, undercover people and they were provocative agents and other people I've talked to said their organizations had these uh, provocateurs in them who turned out to be uh, FBI agents. What else you got, Craig? Well, let me see. I clipped a little thing out of the paper. I think it was the Austin paper. I neglected to mark it. Careless me. This is a direct quote. I wonder if you could guess who said this. I quote, Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every <laughs> rocket fired yeah. signifies, in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. This is not a way of life at all in any true sense. Under the cloud of war, it is humanity hanging on a cross of iron. You guys have any idea who said that? Yeah, he also said, as part of that, every warship launched, every gun that is fired, every bomb that is dropped, represents a theft, a theft from those people who are hungry and don't have enough clothes and don't have work. You obviously know who it is. <laughs> <laughs> who do you think, Stokely Carmichael? <laughs> no, that was Dwight David Eisenhower. Oh, that subversive president we had. Yes, indeed. And he was a Republican, I may note, and the commander of Allied forces in Europe during the war. So you might think he would know something about that. <laughs> and now the second in a three-part series on covert action with John Stockwell and Lewis Wolf. John, there has been over the last few years also a small handful of journalists who have been sort of CIA watchdogs, most prominent of which has been Lewis Wolf. We have an interview with him. Maybe you can, to introduce this interview, tell us a little bit about Lewis Wolf and his journalistic publications. Who is Lewis and what has he been doing over the years and why is the government so outraged by him? Well, his background is, is uh, it's thoroughly uh, legitimate standard, if you will, uh, journalism. He, he was assigned for a couple of years in Manchester, writing for a couple of prominent uh, news organizations. Manchester, and, England? England? Yes, uh -huh, Manchester, England. Mm. And uh, eventually uh, made his way uh, through London back to the United States where he uh, gravitated to uh, a scrutiny of the CIA and the intelligence community, watching the revelations of the church committee, information that he had come across in his research, some of which he had published as part of news stories previously, other parts of which he was not permitted to publish by the nature of the press establishment. And so he uh, put together with Bill Schapp and Ellen Ray the Covert Action Information Bulletin, whose function was to focus on the intelligence organizations of the United States and discuss and expose in a, in a perfectly legitimate way the covert action activities of the CIA principally, as well as the other uh, intelligence organizations. Uh, I believe they formed that in about 1976 and have been in Washington since publishing stories of 
true stories, their quality, their standards of journalism are exceedingly high. Uh, that bulletin is distributed in the State Department and it's sold out the first morning that it's put on the stands in the State Department newsstands. Uh, they also publish in that bulletin the names of CIA agents and where they are now as they're assigned and reassigned about the world. Uh, I believe that in very recent months they have ceased the policy of publishing yeah. uh, names because the controversy is so hot and they would just as soon and, and also, it's never been their intention to break the law. They've made that clear from the outset. Bill Schapp is the brother. He is a, a highly competent attorney and is the brother of a top sportscaster in New York City. He is a very articulate man himself and has testified to the Senate many times against the names of Agents Bill, for example, and, and uh, defending what he and Lou Wolf are doing. And... Uh, after his testimony, many times senators have come up and shaken his hand and said, I disagree with you, but you certainly make your case for the legitimacy of what you're doing very well. Let's, let's, yeah, let's take a look at uh, some of the things which Lewis Wolf had to say, and we'll let you comment ever so often on, on this, okay? What in the years that you've been publishing it do you think are some of your most significant revelations? Are there some stories that even shocked you? Well, I think one of the big stories that we were able to document in some detail was the, the, the whole scope of CIA activities similar to what the CIA did in Chile and which was documented by the Senate Select Committee was the uh, whole covert action program in Jamaica in, uh, between 1976 and 1980. And we were we did a great deal of research into that, and we discovered uh, many in many ways a very similar program, almost a classic model that was followed along the lines of, of what they did in Chile, uh, including three major categories: uh, military, paramilitary activity, uh, the use of propaganda in the in the media, uh, and the third one, which was economic warfare, using uh, the multilateral organizations the International Monetary Fund and others to withhold loans which had been promised to the Jamaican government. Uh, this is one example. Okay, what are a couple uh, more of the details of that? You particularly you mentioned those first two examples of actual paramilitary activity well, the CIA was involved in in Jamaica. There was a fire, for example, that took place uh, in Jamaica of an old people's home. Uh, uh, I think 150 old and infirmed women, many of them blind, were living in this home and uh, as it turned out the, the place burned down in the space of about eight minutes seven or eight minutes um, it was discovered that the phone wires had been cut and that uh, the exits had all been blocked even those who could see their way out could not get out um, and uh, that the means by which the fire was set was the use of a petroleum jelly which was unavailable in Jamaica. This was one indication among others that there was outside help. Uh, why, the would the, this, why would uh, the CIA, you might ask, why mm -hmm. would the CIA want to uh, right. murder 150 old women? It was because it was an effort, part of a very large-scale effort to discredit the government in Jamaica which was at the time uh, uh, headed by Michael Manley, the Prime Minister. Uh, there were images produced of Michael Manley in the uh, media, in the Daily Gleaner, which was the newspaper which the United States, uh, through the CIA, helped to support. Uh, and there is a good deal of evidence of that. There were images of Michael Manley showing a death mask. I mean, it was his face which had been somehow made to look like a death mask, although it was pretending to be a, a photograph of him. Um, and there were many ways to try and discredit him. This is very, very similar, in fact, to what the CIA did to try and discredit uh, Salvador Allende in Chile. If you remember, uh, Richard Nixon instructed the CIA in a meeting, uh, which was in 1970, in the White House, and there was a, a document in the Senate com report, which is reprinted, and he said, make the economy scream. Those were his words. And that's, of course, what the CIA proceeded to do in Chile, and that's what uh, they also did in Jamaica. They also had furnished uh, a lot of munitions and assistance to the terrorist squads that were going around killing people in the, in the cities and also in the countryside in Jamaica as well. That's correct. 
Well, John, you had a trip down to Jamaica, and you saw a lot of these things about Jamaica with your own eyes, right? Yes, indeed. I, uh, a very moving, a very interesting trip to me to see uh, a target country at a time in the height of a CI operation when I was completely outside. So there's no way that I could see, to see the problem that journalists have always had when the U.S. government was targeting on a country in a situation, trying to destabilize it, overthrow or manipulate the elections or whatever, of trying to figure out what's going on when you don't have access to all of the flow of cables and the discussions and National Security Council meetings and whatnot for the planning. I observed that from published information, the CIA station there was quite large for that size of a country. It was huge, in fact. It was bigger than any station I knew of in Africa, although Jamaica was a fairly small island with two million people. That's typical of when the CIA has, has got a big operation going in a place, they beef up the station and beef up the offices back stateside. The tone and flow of uh, articles in the Gleaner was, of course, as Lou says, um, definitely a chapter out of Chile or a chapter out of the Angolan operation. Uh, every indication of a massive CIA operation going to destabilize the government, to make the economy scream. And uh, in that case, I would say that uh, probably someone got promoted for that one, probably several people. Because Manley was run out of because office. Because it worked. By he a legitimate... Was, yeah, without, without a scandal, without uh, an assassination, without uh, uh, the things that have caused the CIA so much grief, uh, uh, Manley, a champion of, of social democracy, of, of giving the people a piece of the pie, uh, was thrown out of office, and an arch-capitalist uh, was put in office. And, uh, and again, there was uh, minimal adverse publicity. Uh, Lou Wolf and the others were studying the situation and did publish about what was going on, but it was not published in the New York Times and the Washington Post and the big, uh, the, the big television networks didn't do studies on it, primarily because even if the journalists uh, of the big organs knew what was happening and might have wanted to uh, they really just, because of the secrecy, couldn't get the truth about what the United States was doing. Uh, one interesting thing was that uh, the effectiveness of the lies, the liars in our government, you know, the duplicity. When we formed the CIA, we committed our leaders to having two policies, as Lou says, the rhetoric, the public statements, and the truth about what United States policy is. So an interesting measure of, of presidents is how effectively they lie. Interesting discussions that occur inside the CIA is about lying. Would, would you lie? You know, you're the DDO and you're going to testify to the Senate. And it's serious discussions. Are you going to lie? Because if you do, it's perjury and there's a chance you could go to jail. And yet, you know, the organization expects you to lie. Uh, President Carter was one of the most effective liars I have ever watched on television and through the media. As a poker player, man, I would never go up against that man. <laughs> he could look at that camera and st say things that obviously he knew were completely and totally false. And I would study his expression and I could detect nothing except occasionally a little wisp of a smile that wasn't consistent with what he was saying, like he thought it was funny. But one of his more nervous classic... tech, actually. It, well, the, the, the smile that I was referring to wasn't that. It was just a kind of like he was repressing a grin, like mm -hmm. he thought it was funny. How he rationalized these things, I don't know. But one of his most uh, of conspicuous lies was when he sat down with Manley just a few weeks before the elections uh, in Washington and told him face to face that uh, the CI don't have the CI doing anything to destabilize you or your government. We have no such program going, when obviously he did. And uh, he, he pulled it off to the point where even Manley was troubled. Very effective lie, liar. Uh, another major story that we, we uncovered was the whole range of uh, CIA media operations uh, throughout the world. We did an analysis of these operations and the use of uh, 
uh, money, a very large-scale money, is thought between uh, uh, one-third and, and 40 percent of the CIA's budget. And I should say that that budget figure is the biggest secret that there mm -hmm. is in Washington today. Um, at that time, it was estimated that the 1978 budget was uh, in the range of one and a half billion dollars. Uh, a more recent estimate by a, a military journal, not uh, a liberal journal by any means, uh, estimated that the CIA's budget today is in the range of ten billion dollars. Uh, at any rate, uh, this analysis that we made of the CIA's media operations disclosed, among other things, that they deliver through uh, CIA couriers um, ready to print or ready to broadcast news, and I put that in inverted commas, uh, which is um, used by the media. Uh, and this is created uh, by the CIA. How often does the CIA manipulate the media in this way, plant stories, get their views in the media? Is this fairly common as a modus operandi for the CIA? It goes beyond your, in the, in the course of the past 30 years, it goes beyond your wildest imagination. The extent to which the CIA has gone to manipulate public opinion. If you include the MH Chaos program, which was a billion dollar program, of setting up proprietary companies, setting up student organizations so they could draw radical students in and do every kind of, of duplicious manipulation of, of national student movements, press, propaganda, labor, extensive formation of labor unions, funding of major labor unions with the objective essentially of manipulating the mind and attitudes of workers throughout the nation and the world. This was the essential tool that they used to destabilize Chile and overthrow Allende, was, of course, making the economy scream, getting to the military officers, but it was essentially the truckers' union that finally brought the country down uh, and justified, quote, justified Pinochet's takeover of power. 5,000 university professors they've co-opted. This is church committee revelations. I'm not making this up. It's in print, church committee's revelations. 5,000 university professors co-opted to help the CIA manipulate people's minds. 400 journalists in the U.S., including big-name journalists. Now, that's a big chunk of the prominent journalists co-opted to function routinely to put, help the CIA put out its stories and biases to the world. There are a whole range of, uh, of areas wherein the CIA provides briefings to uh, selected journalists, and there are numerous cases where the CIA has, for example, published uh, books, and s several thousand books were published in English by, uh, by the CIA, and this is documented in the Church Committee report. They set up 250 news services and wire services, some of which, not all, but some of which are still uh, in the pocket of the CIA. Uh, and I think it's only fair to, to say that uh, even some journalists who don't realize, there are some who are witting, but there are also some who do not realize that they're being uh, targeted by the CIA uh, when they come home from a trip overseas. They might talk to somebody and they don't realize, uh, at least right away, uh, who they're talking to, and then it turns out that they've uh, um, been the source of information which was used by the CIA. And then specific operations around the world from corner to corner to discredit this individual, create an impression about that situation, such as El Salvador, the famous white papers in the Angolan operation, which I, I note were, you know, back in, the, back in the good old days, we did a better job. Our, <laughs> our white papers in the Angolan operation were based on very sp specific photographs and hard information of Soviet ships putting into Puerto Ambuim in Angola. Uh, the white paper that the CIA produced for Alexander Haig to justify the intervention in El Salvador uh, was a piece of trash. It was discredited by the right and the left and the center. It didn't hold together. Uh, I should point, for example, to the, uh, the stories that came out uh, during the Angola operation where it was discovered that uh, the CIA was involved in a massive covert operation which the Congress cut off when they learned about it. Um, there were certainly a small handful, uh, really a tiny handful, you could count them on the fingers of one hand, of the members of Congress who knew about that operation uh, and the scale of it. 
beforehand, and then uh, they cut it off. Well, one of the revelations at the time that came out was that the CIA had uh, created a story that was planted in the media that the uh, Cubans who were in Angola at the time were raping uh, Angolan women and that uh, they were uh, uh, really doing very, very gross things to these women and, and killing them. Uh, well, it was disclosed, in fact, by John Stockwell, among other people, who was the former CIA uh, station chief or in charge of the CIA's task force in Angola, that that whole story was created by the CIA station in, in Zambia uh, and in, uh, in, um, in Zaire. Uh, where they sat around a table and wrote this story and then it was fed to a a stringer who then fed it to a news service who then got it to the AP Associated Press who then picked it up and was sent around the world and was printed in hundreds of newspapers as fact but you can rest assured that it it is at least very difficult for the American people including us to know what is true about the Sandinista government in Nicaragua for example or about El Salvador, or about Argentina and the Falklands right now. Our former ally of a month ago is now our enemy in this confrontation. In Jamaica, for example, and then this, this very uh, specific, uh, the, the Libyan hit squad, the, not, the, the mythical Libyan hit squad. We had a situation where Reagan, and, uh, President Reagan and President Gaddafi were confronting each other internationally. Reagan ordered our ship into what Libya claims as its wa waters with the specific intention of, of either standing uh, Gaddafi down or provoking an incident. And it worked. He shot down two Libyan jet fighter planes. And then Gaddafi was incensed and there was a credibility problem. There was the president of the giant United States confronting this relatively small Arab country. I guess this leads us to your covert action information bulletin uh, because there's a story in here about the hit squads and it actually originated apparently with the Israeli secret police, the Mossad. It's a very interesting case study of, uh, of how uh, these propaganda operations uh, can come about. Uh, apparently since the Israelis working as they have for many years very closely, the, the Israeli secret intelligence service or Mossad, uh, has worked very, very closely with the CIA, and in fact, the CIA helped to set it up uh, back in the in the mid 50s. It originally, uh, part of the story came from Mossad that mm -hmm. uh, there were two uh, people who apparently were uh, either employed or were agents, uh, contract agents for Mossad, who fed some of this information to the U.S. government. I see. Uh, and the U.S. government was fully prepared to believe it. Um, they said that one of their witnesses or one of their sources had been uh, polygraphed and had checked out, his information had checked out. There was a story suggesting that uh, it was reported by one of the networks that somebody had been offered a quarter of a million dollars for his information uh, to the effect that there were hit squads. Um, and some of it originated, as I said, from Mossad and some of it originated from CIA uh, fabrications. Jack Anderson, for example, reported that uh, some of the information that he had been given and reported in his column had turned out to, to have been CIA fabrications. It's important to remember that the Israelis, as much, I guess, as uh, the U.S., considers uh, it a priority to discredit and to possibly destabilize uh, or overthrow the Libyan government. Uh, and one method that they saw, thought of, I guess, was to create a story that uh, said that uh, Libya had sent death squads to assassinate uh, President Reagan and other high officials. Uh, what were only the recent yeah, go ahead. Well, only recently, uh, some of the same high officials who before were saying that uh, there were, that they had evidence that some of these hit squads had enter entered the country through right. Canada are now on record and quoted in uh, Newsweek and in other media saying that they never uh, located a single person and a single uh, single evidence that there was uh, a hit squad and yet they say there is still a threat <laughs> well um, uh, I think it's fair to assume though there is not enough information yet to say but it's fair to assume that the CIA was hoping through this to create 
a justification for further intervention in, in Libya, possible um, military activity or economic boycott as, uh, or blockade as they've now proposed, as has been proposed by the White House. Well, let's take a look at some of the articles in the latest issue of the Covert Action Information Bulletin. Not only will it give you an idea of what the magazine is about, it's, uh, oh my goodness, over 50 pages, but also it gives just this one issue, gives a good example of the widespread operations, not only of the CIA, it's not just restricted to the CIA, but mercenary activities around the world as well. We have been following the Seychelles Island attempted coup for ever since it started and we did a program with John Stockwell just recently mm -hmm. where we mentioned that. I noticed on um, page four you have an article that says Shell beat back the mercenaries. This is quite a complex operation which involves South Africa and mercenaries and the French. Was the CIA involved in that? Uh, there's still a lot of information that will come out but uh, it is known that the some of the activity I, I should say primarily the main um, source of the coup or attempted coup was South Africa. Uh, that South African intelligence, uh, including one admitted former, so-called former uh, member of the South African intelligence corps, uh, who says that he quote unquote retired in order to go for a visit to the Seychelles uh, for uh, his vacation. Um, and the, largely the, the, the program was uh, initiated by the, by the South Africans. Uh, it does appear, however, that the United States, which has had an ongoing interest uh, in creating a base of operations in the Indian Ocean, uh, and the Seychelles is, is a very strategic area, not just because of its, uh, it has no large natural resources as such, but that it is of critical importance to to the U.S. as a, as a jumping point uh, in, the, in, in the Indian Ocean. It looks like there are other aspects, too, that they're also trying to keep the government of Mauritius from becoming a more progressive government. There were some significant elections coming up. Plus, there was something I didn't know at all, and that was the fact that there is an island chain, Comoros, which actually were taken over in a coup, which was carried out by mercenaries. Yes, uh, that, in that case it was largely French intelligence which uh, was the source of that one. Um, there is some indication that the CIA was uh, involved, though somewhat peripherally, in that one. So I can see where that could stimulate people like in the, the group down in New Orleans of, missionar of missionaries. Boy, they are, in a way, aren't they? <laughs> of, of mercenaries that uh, were going to take over Dominica Yes. Uh, since the Apparently the plot fell through for Grenada, and they've seen that it can happen in Comoros that they actually can take over an island government and run it. The so the case of the, the attempted uh, coup in, in Dominica is a very interesting one, and here the U.S. Uh, involvement is rather rather uh, uh, strong. Uh, there was an attempt to build a force mainly uh, made up of members of the Ku Klux Klan, uh, together with some other former. Uh, and active mercenaries uh, who had uh, long involvement in U.S. Special Forces and Army uh, background. And uh, they at first in their first idea was to invade Grenada, uh, but then they realized that the Grenadian government probably would be able to, to uh, offset their activities and, and probably defeat them, and uh, since their security forces are quite well uh, organized there. And so they uh, changed their plan and, and decided to go into Dominica. The former prime minister, Patrick John, who was very, very closely identified with South Africa, in fact, he had helped to set up a monitoring station and also a, a base for uh, the manufacture of uh, long-range uh, tor torpedoes, which could be built uh, with the help of South Africa, on, uh, in, uh, which he helped to set up. Uh, and Basically, uh, they had hoped, and he had hoped, that if, they, if the coup succeeded, and he agreed with the Klan people, that uh, if it su succeeded, that he would give them rights to casinos, to gambling operations, to he would even give them several posts in his cabinet if he came back to power. Uh, well, of course, needless to say, it failed. But uh, See, was there some dopes, um, yes. some narcotics business yes, involved exactly there too, wasn't also. there? 
this is as there often is in yeah. these things. This is on page forty-four, by the way. We're getting a little bit ahead of it. Yeah, this is also covered in the same uh, in the same. Yes. This highlights a point, though, that we've made several times on this show: how the CIA will use anyone to carry through their objectives. The Ku Klux Klan, mercenaries, the mafia, drug operations. It's reasons like this that John Stockwell thinks that the CIA is completely corrupt and immoral operation. Not, not to mention the 800,000 people that have been killed through CIA operations. Uh, I think 800,000 is a very, very conservative figure, but yes, yeah. that's, that's uh, correct. Uh, there is clearly a trend today in the CIA to, to uh, move more in the direction of contracting out some of the operations that it does not really want to get itself, uh, not that it doesn't want to get involved, but doesn't want to get caught uh, with its pants down right. doing it. And so some of the more sensitive activities they're branching out and letting other, either other intelligence services or other quote-unquote private uh, freelance types. It looks like <clears throat> um, that they are developing a very significant alliance with the South Africans and the Argentinas. Once again, these are both covered in this uh, edition of the uh, Covert Inf Action Information Bulletin. Angola, the Pretoria's continuing war, talks about the South African involvement there. Mozambique rebels exposed once again. We find South Africa involved in that. And the CIA in that case. Yeah, and the CIA. And then we get to an article here about Argentina activates international death squads. And this article shows that these, oh God, wretched, horrible people in, uh, involved in a tremendous amount of torture and maiming and killing of people in uh, Argentina are now, like I say, they're subcontractees. And not only that, but the U.S. is trying to make a regional type of kind of a NATO. It's called SATO, which is a good SATO for SATO, SATO. But anyway, with South Africa taking care of the area in the Indian Ocean and Africa, and Argentina taking care of Central America and South America. In fact, Argentina said they would be glad to come up and help with the El Salvadorian folks, right? That's correct. Uh, Argentina, if there's a country in the world that has perfected the art of torture and the art of making people disappear, it is Argentina. Uh, and thousands upon thousands of Argentinians uh, have, have disappeared. And uh, uh, I think that this article demonstrates, and this was an article which we did a lot of research on and which was the result of a lot of press reports which came out in some of them in South Africa itself of the fact that the, CIA, that the Argentinians had sent some of their more renowned and best known torturers to South Africa because they could no longer uh, be active in Argentina, they were so well known. So they sent them to South Africa as part of the diplomatic corps in the Argentine embassy. And they were special uh, in torture. Yes, it remember, is, go ahead. It is unclear at this point whether they were advising the South Africans who also know a good deal about uh, how to torture people and how to, uh, how to make people die in prison as, to, as they have the highest rate of uh, death of people in, in their prisons. Uh, whether, in fact, they're training each other is unclear, but uh, certainly they have a good deal of, of sh sharing and common interests uh, involved. We showed the movie on company business, which you, or sections of the movie on company business, which you might remember. This movie showed the complicity of the CIA with torture all around the world. As a matter of fact, there are CIA torture schools in the United States. They bring people over here from various uh, countries abroad, police, military teach them the very sophisticated ways of torture, then they go back and operate on their own folks back home. And just to make sure that everything goes right, the CIA then has their agents, which go down and supervise. They hold clinics. They bring people off the streets and torture them. I mean, it sounds like something which you couldn't even think up out of a sick imagination, but this is what goes on. And the uh, next article in your bulletin for March talks about the Salvadorian deserter who uh, disclosed the Green Beret torture role. This was in the news just recently. And it has actually the transcript and a considerable summary of what actually went on. It showed the Americans supervising and helping out, and they tortured the first person to show that uh, how it should be done. This was a 14-year-old boy. 
Then the next person brought in was a 13-year-old girl, and of course, after raping her, then they let the El Salvadorians try it and uh, make sure they did it right. It, it's a gruesome story, and, and I think this is an example of uh, something that the American people are being asked to, to overlook or to turn a blind eye to. That is the brutality of the Salvadoran government. It is not a case of uh, Salvadoran, of uh, President Duarte as quote-unquote a moderate person who's trying to stand up to the forces both from left and right. Which the New York uh, Times always says. Exactly. It was, in fact, the New York Times in a story in January who disclosed the first part of the story, which was that the Green Berets, eight of them, were present during a torture session. And it was a major story. Uh, uh, strangely, it was such a major story, but it was on page two of the New York Times rather than on page one. But it was a very big and important story. I would say, however, that uh, uh, one of the reasons, I guess, was that the, the Salvadoran, the member of the Salvadoran army who talked about this, who is now des deserted and who is living in Mexico, uh, he was somewhat intimidated, I guess, by talking to the New York Times, and he's later revealed to the to Mexican media, and that's the transcript in this store in this article, that the special forces, and I should say the U.S. special forces, was created originally by the CIA. Uh, the special forces were actually involved in the torture, as opposed to standing by observing it. They said they didn't rape the little girl, though. I mean, there is some morality left, oh, yes. right? Lewis, how does this torture and all of these CIA covert operations fit into American foreign policy as a whole? You have a couple articles in your current journal about the role of the CIA and these sorts of operations we're talking about within American foreign policy. Could you focus on that for a minute? Well, I, I guess it comes down to the, the whole uh, doctrine that the United States feels it has to uh, keep its role and its sphere of influence or its spheres of influence. Uh, uh, and part of this is putting governments in power and part of it is keeping them in power. Now, there are many governments with whom the United States has been closely mm -hmm. identified around the country who cannot stay in power without massive repression. Uh, and, uh, of course, El Salvador is one. There are many others around the world in all the three continents. Uh, Argentina and South Africa for two. Absolutely. Obviously. Uh, South Korea is another example, uh, and the Philippines. Uh, I think uh, we have to understand, though, that uh, what, why would the United States do this? Is it simply to keep somebody who is a friend of the United States in power, um, successive presidents, and it's not just Reagan and it's not Carter before him, it's successive presidents since, basically since the 50s, since Eisenhower, have uh, been uh, working hand in glove and even have been on camera embracing successive dictators with whom we've been identified. Uh, the most recent example, if you remember, was the case of uh, of Jimmy Carter embracing the Shah of Iran a few months before he was overthrown on the steps of the White House. Um, I think it's because of the CIA's involvement and, in fact, direction of much of these uh, activities. It's not that the CIA is working uh, on its own, as, as some people suggest, as a rogue elephant. The CIA works directly under the, uh, under the uh, uh, guidance and direction of the chi uh, chief of state, of the president. And, of course, this, this president not only doesn't know, but doesn't want to know every day what the CIA is doing. But the fact of the matter is that, they, that they're doing what the president asked them to do. And the other thing I should just mention quickly is that the CIA carries out these activities to keep the interests of the corporations, U.S. corporations, who have great interests uh, at stake, for example, in South Africa and in all the other countries we've mentioned. That's right. The multinationals value stability above everything else, plus the ability to operate there, keep the economy low as far as wages, and be able to take the riches out of the country. And these right-wing dictatorships let them do that. Of course, there's a point which is reached, that, like in El Salvador, once it gets too far and the people really start and not uh, a revolution, then the multinationals suffer there. 
and there is a certain level beyond which the U.S., when it becomes publicly known, as opposed to known in the country itself, publicly known in the United States that the U.S. is so closely identified with such a repressive regime as today in El Salvador, uh, that it finally realizes it has to fish or cut bait. It has to decide whether we continue to support this openly or whether we have to find other ways to support, as, a, as for example, Argentina has now offered, uh, we understand, directly to the United States to be a surrogate for the U.S. in, in, in El Salvador. Also, Honduras is, mm -hmm. is playing that role. This is what's so chilling about this Agents Identities Information Act, that it will cover over the possibility of the media exposing the worst abuses of the CIA, which will mean the American people won't know what it's doing. We'll have a secret government, and we will therefore increase the power and the scope of operations of the CIA. Whereas in the past, when there has been media and public focus on CIA operations and excesses, there has been pressure to cut back yes. on the CIA. I think, however, the most uh, threatening part of this is the, is the whole uh, move towards greater and greater secrecy, and uh, so that the media will not even have the opportunity to report on this whole area. Uh, it will be illegal almost for a, a journalist, uh, for one of the major media, to write or to report uh, about intelligence. Uh, in many ways, it, that will just be beyond the pale now. This also ties in with the progress of Senate Bill 1 in the Senate, or the great-grandson of Senate Bill 1, which is designed to take away a lot of our civil liberties. We're gradually becoming a police state, really, it looks like, doesn't it? Well, I, what can I, be done about it? Uh, well, I don't feel it's uh, fair to uh, be rhetorical about this. I agree that there is a move in towards greater and greater uh, secrecy and greater and greater uh, or less and less accountability of the government to the people. And uh, uh, there are, of course, a lot of uh, people who are opposed to this, including uh, quite a few members of Congress. Uh, for example, 29 members of Congress signed a resolution challenging the right of the president to intervene in El Salvador under the War Powers Act. Uh, he has no right to, to do this, and they're challenging his right. Uh, and that's 29 members out of uh, hundreds, but it is a significant, I think, indication that there is, even in the halls of Congress, uh, opposition to his policies as well as in the country at large. I mean, the overwhelming majority are against Reagan's policy in El Salvador. And I think the uh, uh, recent polls have shown that uh, the p foreign policy in general mm -hmm. is not entirely accepted or mm -hmm. is uh, there is great doubt and great wonderment uh, as to whether there's any continuity, whether the policy is thought out, whether it's based on realities or only the uh, very anti-communist rhetoric of this administration. Uh, there are also quite a few uh, people high in the administration who uh, have intelligence backgrounds, and uh, this is another indication that the, that the uh, intelligence is on the, on the rise in, in this administration. Lewis, is the final question, and to conclude, what can the American people do against these worst excesses of the CIA and indeed against the threats to all of our civil liberties involved in some of these bills that are being passed that will unleash the CIA? I think the biggest thing is that people can educate themselves as to what is going on, to read their press, uh, and to demand to know what is going on from, from the media, uh, to uh, try and exercise their rights, that is to let their Congress, their member of Congress, know that they don't uh, accept whatever the policy may be, uh, even to demonstrate uh, publicly if they're opposed to these activities. I think most of all is to, be, to keep themselves informed and to speak out against it. Well, thank you very much for... And good luck. Us. And watch, you. watch your way home. There may be somebody following you. Well, I, I believe it's best to, uh, <laughs> to speak out openly and, uh, and not be paranoid. I'm, <laughs> I'm not uh, willing to resign myself to... Uh, and fear. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And that is the second of our three-part series on covert action, the CIA. And now we have a final word from Doug.
Here are some of the antics that the moral majority has been up to recently. The head of their Maryland chapter, Jim Wright, recently went to the, Mar the Maryland state legislature and complained about some bakery that was selling gingerbread cookies of little boys and little girls whose anatomy was displayed in these cookies. And predictably, the cookie source sales soared after the moral majority attack on these cookies, and evidently the legislators are still laughing in Maryland about that. Not quite as funny is the head of the moral majority in New York, a Reverend Dan Four, was recently caught with his foot in the mouth in an interview with the New York Times. First of all, he told the Times that the Jews have God-given ability to make money. They control the media, they control the city. When the Jewish reporter who was interviewing him mentioned that Jews had been subject to inquisitions throughout the centuries and that the anti-Semitism in the moral majority was feeding into this, he said that the head of the moral majority said that, well, there was never any Christian persecution of Jews, and the, um, moral, the reporter Joe Klein in the New York Times re reminded him of the Spanish Inquisition and its persecution of Jews. Here's what the moral majority said. Well, those weren't Christians. They were Roman Catholics. <laughs> strange uh, distinction. <laughs> and then last but not least, the head of the Santa Clara County chapter of the moral majority opined to reporters that capital punishment would be in line with Bible dictates and appropriate treatment for homosexuality. Now, it's true that the moral majority has been criticized recently in the media and it's also argued that the kiss of death in a political election is moral majority support. We've seen two elections recently in Austin on housing discrimination for, and the school board where the moral majority got heavily involved in this and the opponents were able to mobilize opposition to this moral majority attempt to legislate its morality and was able to defeat moral majority initiatives. Moreover, the moral majority television programs are getting more and more in debt, and I read in broadcasting that their viewing audience has gone down about 16%. Now, you would think that the moral majority would be on the defensive and in a retreat, but in fact, Jerry Falwell is exploiting these attacks on the moral majority to try to raise more money. Every month, he sends out a new fundraising letter saying that they're about to go bankrupt and that they will be destroyed by their enemies unless you dig into your pockets and send the moral majority some more money. So there was a result of this, whereas last year they were only able to raise $2 million, they've already in the last 12 months been able to raise $5.7 million, and I've been increasingly successful with these crisis campaigns to raise money and to play on the sympathies of their supporters that the moral majority is a beleaguered oppositional group that's being attacked by all these liberals and humanists, etc. So we're far from having heard the last of the moral majority, unfortunately. This concludes the second in our three-part series on covert action, featuring John Stockwell, former CIA official, and Lewis Wolf, co-editor of Covert Action Information Bulletin. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78712. If you'd like to write to us, give us some of your feedback, we'd really like to hear from you. Please contact us at this address. Good night.